Hello my goblins and ghouls, my name is Steven, and today we are cracking into Rev 3 of the feeder, namely the PCB. In all previous revisions of the feeder, I got greedy. I wanted to have my cake and eat it too, and I wanted to dispense the tape forward and remove the film using one motor. There are a lot of feeders that do this either with some really creative gearing or like a little tab that kind of scoops underneath the film and kind of just pushes it out of the way. And while that does work for some tapes, for a lot of others, it is a little less reliable. I got really inconsistent results. So I decided to add 75 cents to the bomb cost. <laughs> And we're adding another motor, finally. This rev is gonna have a completely dedicated film peeling motor whose only job is to remove the film off the tape. So in order to facilitate this change, we've got a new PCB. This puppy is considerably bigger than the last version. Oh yeah. That's a bump right there, it's the camel. <laughs> but all of this extra space here is really just to help facilitate adding this extra motor that's gonna be sticking out the top with a spool that'll be peeling the film off. But a ton of it is the same. It still has two buttons, it has two LEDs, it uses the same VCNT 2020 optical sensor. It still uses a spring finger interface to like actually talk to the whole feeder, but that is about where the similarities end. This new feeder board is designed to work with the STM32 F0, 030 I think. It's a tiny little sucker and it's sense, like it barely costs anything in bulk, but it has just enough peripherals for me to do what I need to do on this. The other huge change with this board is RS-485. Do you see this footprint right here next to the spring finger pads? This is actually for receiving the RS-485 and converting it back into serial to talk to the microcontroller. So we should be able to just take a bunch of these boards and put them all together in a bus configuration and all the feeders will be communicating on the same RS-485 line. It's gonna be so awesome. If you want a primer on what RS-485 is, there's a link I'll plop up here so you can take a peek at it. And that's the long and short of it. I've actually started live streaming designs for this project on Twitch and I made this whole board live on stream. You can go to twitch.tv slash Stephen Hawes or there's a link in the description if you wanna tune in and steer me away from critical, horrible mistakes, which has already happened like at least a dozen times. <laughs> Alrighty, let's solder some parts out of this thing. I've been working on this board for about 40 minutes and I've already found a mistake. Granted, it's a very small one. So if I had to have a mistake, I will happily have it be this. I just happened to pick the wrong footprint for the JTAG header. On the motherboard, the STM32 has a built-in USB bootloader. So you can just connect USB directly to the chip itself and it can receive new firmware really easily over that USB port. This chip is too small to have that kind of functionality in it, so you have to program it over SWD, which is kind of just a variation on JTAG. I kind of think of it like the ICSP header on AVR chips, except it can do a little bit more stuff with debugging, and it's pretty cool. I picked the two millimeter spacing header on this, and I only have 2.54 millimeter or one millimeter spacing headers, so I'm gonna have to do a little bodge, but it should be fine. Then we'll be able to connect the programmer to it, and hopefully, it will take code, and then we can put all the rest of the stuff on it. All right, bodge number one. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, the jankness has concluded. I've soldered on my incorrect spacing headers so that I can make this little adapter to the cable that plugs into the Blackmagic Probe. So everything should be wired up okay, even if it is a little messy. And the Blackmagic Probe is the actual thing that's going to put the firmware onto the chip over SWD. It's really similar to how you can make an Arduino become a programmer for another Arduino. It's called an Arduino as ISP. This is as I understand it, pretty much the same kind of thing. It's also an STM32 just with special firmware on it that lets it put firmware onto another chip. Super cool. You can also do cool debugging stuff with it. I'm barely scratching the surface of what you can do with this thing, but for right now, we're just gonna use it to try and test upload some firmware to the board. I should have everything that I need in order to get the chip to spin up. I wrote just a really basic blink sketch just to see if we can get anything to load on it at all which compiles no problem. So now let's plug this into the computer and see what we get. Okay. No magic smoke. Let's see if we got power. Oh baby, 3.3 volts. We're ready to try. Upload. Okay, I think that was it. So the pin I set aside for switch one should be toggling. Yes! Oh my gosh, what a relief! Oh, cool! <laughs> well, that's a huge relief. <laughs> okay, so if we know that works, now we should be good to solder on the motor drivers, all the other little switches and buttons and dials and stuff, the optical sensor, and pretty much everything else on the board. We're just gonna barf it all on there, see what we get. That is such a relief! <laughs> So, so I found another mistake I've made with this board. I neglected to put a like heat dissipation pad underneath the DRV8833 motor driver. And I have had problems with this chip in the past when I don't ground this. If you remember a couple episodes, a few episodes back, I actually had to drill a hole from the bottom side of the PCB to connect it. Well, I continued to make that mistake. And when it is attached on there, the whole system shorts out, nothing powers up at all. This is really easy with a board fix, but I don't wanna do that right now. I wanna get this thing running. So I'm gonna try a couple things. First, I'm gonna try and scratch away some of the solder mass to actually kind of make a pad. I got lucky and there happens to be a ground plane right underneath the pad. So if I just remove some of the solder mask, I'm kind of just making my own pad. And if that doesn't work, I'll try soldering a little enamel wire to the pad on the bottom of the chip, wiring that up to some other point on the board that has ground, and then trying to get the legs to reach down to the board with that like half a millimeter distance that the enamel wire is gonna bump the chip up. I plug this thing into the five volts and test the voltage regulator and it works okay. So I'm pretty sure it's just the fact that this chip is not connected on the ground pad. So bodge number two. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> The bodge actually worked. Just a little bit of scratching and a bit of reflow and it connected the pad, no problem. I've had this problem before, so I was pretty sure that was the case, but still. Okay, so now that it's actually taking firmware, 
I'm going to try and rewrite the feeder firmware for this, or at least take my old stuff and try and adapt it for this chip and all the different pinout. There are a few new things that I have to add into the feeder firmware, namely the film tension switch. So last time there was just one motor and it was just for driving the tape forward, but this time there's a second one for peeling the film off of the tape. The way that the feeder is gonna know when it needs to keep spooling up the film or when to stop is that the film is gonna be tensioned over a little lever arm. When the spool pulls hard enough, it'll take that arm and it'll push down this little switch. When the feeder sees that the switch is closed, it knows it's pulled enough on the spool and it won't tension anymore. But then when the main motor drives the tape forward a little more, it makes a little bit of slack, the arm comes up, the switch isn't depressed, and then it knows to spool up just a little bit more until it sees that switch close again. A bunch of feeders use this design, and I'm just hoping that this implementation works pretty well, but that's the next episode, all the CADs coming down the pike. Right now, I just need to worry about getting these switches wired up into the right configuration so it makes the feeder do what I want it to. Okay, it's code time, baby! Guess what, folks? We have basic functionality in the feeder. You can tell it's a prototype because there's a lot of wires hanging off of it. Scooch on in. Scooch, come on. There we go. Oh, you're a little close. You're a little close. So we've got our two motors connected. This is the one that's going to be driving the tape forward. These are TT motors. I have a lot of them. And right now I have it hooked up so the buttons will control the direction. So if you press the top one, it makes it spin that direction and the green light comes on. You press the other one, it goes the other way. The other one is gonna be for spooling up the film. Right now I just have it connected to this little limit switch up here. So when I push it, it turns on. <laughs> And then of course this last limit switch up here is really only gonna be for the feeder knowing if there's a problem. So when it's not depressed, it'll turn on some warning lights and send a command back over RS-45. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is the meat of it. It's alive! Woof! And there it is. That's a working feeder board. It has the basic functionality of what I'm gonna need from this thing. I also am getting a good solid signal out of the optical sensor, which is also not something I was really worried about. That's worked pretty consistently in the past. So now this design is ready for the mechanical parts. The mechanical stuff in this version is gonna be way more complicated than it was in the last one. All the last one was really doing mechanically was mounting a motor and giving a guide for the tape. This time it's pretty different. There has to be a spool and a like tensioning assembly and a little bar that's gonna let the film peel over it. The last one was just like two blocks with slots in them. So in the next one, we are gonna be taking a crack at printing all those parts out, seeing how they fit, giving them some tuning and hopefully getting nice, clean, active peeling with this PCB. And then after that, it's getting it to talk to the motherboard. We're getting RS-45 going, integrating the two together. What I'm really excited about for that one is getting Marlin to accept new G-code commands. So I'm probably gonna make a new M commander G command that's like, move the feeder. So I'm gonna have to figure out how to integrate my own G-code commands into Marlin, which is gonna be so much fun, but that will be in like two episodes from now. In the meantime though, I have a lot of CAD to do. <laughs> it's gonna be, it's gonna be spicy. All right, that's it for this one. I have a Patreon, so if you'd like to help support me and projects like this, there's a link in the description where you can become a patron. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. But before I go, I wanna thank this video sponsor, PCBUA. PCBUA made the boards for this project and they are so nice. Matte black, gold finish. Mm, they're absolutely gorgeous. They also put the little board designator in like the perfect spot that doesn't mess with the cosmetics of it. I know it's a little thing, but it's tucked away there underneath the JTAG header. PCBUA has just consistently been a really, really good source for PCBs. If you're in the market for getting some boards made, there's a link in the description if you wanna check them out. Thank you so much to PCBUA for sponsoring this video. I think it smells like it's burning. What's burning? Oh well, the smell is gone. <laughs>